class today, we will, inshallah, explore the various roles angels play in our everyday lives and the blessings they bring from the invisible realm by the shah, by the will and permission of Allah as a There are several angels mentioned by name in the Quran with the description of their responsibilities. And for example, Jabril, which uh, you may know in the English is Gabriel, uh, is in charge of communicating Allah's words to his prophets. Israfil or Raphael oversees the blowing of the trumpet to mark the day of judgment. Michael or uh, Makael, uh, the angel that oversees the rainfall and sustenance. Uh, Munkar and Nakir are the, um, after death, these two angels will question our souls in the grave about our faith and deeds and who our prophet was and what our religion was. Malik Amalt, the angel of death, this angel oversees taking possession of souls after death. And Malik, or not Malik, is in the ruler, but Malik, slightly different is the guardian of hell. And uh, Ridwan is the angel who serves as the guardian of heaven. So here we see some that are mentioned by name. There are others that are not mentioned by name, uh, but you find them in the Ahadith and other uh, references. And since we're mentioning this, I would like to talk about the role of fallen angels, this idea of fallen angels in the Islamic paradigm. This concept does not exist uh, because it is the nature, the natural disposition of angels to faithfully fulfill whatever Allah commands them to do. They do not have freedom of will. They have no free choice. And hence, they have no ability to disobey Allah as a wajal. So one of those six articles of faith that I want to make sure you can have at least a five to ten minute conversation about each of them, since this is part of the basis of what you believe. Um, Islam does not believe in unseen beings who have free choice. However, often confused with fallen angels, they are called jinn or spirits. The most famous of the jinn is Iblis, who is known as Shaitan or Satan. And we as Muslims believe that Satan is a disobedient jinn, jinn, not a fallen angel. So we need to really understand that there's a very different thing to a jinn. There's no such thing as a fallen angel in Islam. Jinn are mortal, they are born, they eat, drink, procreate, and die. Um, unlike the angels, which dwell in celestial regions, um, the jinn are said to coexist near to humans, even though they usually remain unseen. Um, so again, this belief in angels is one of the six articles of faith, and I would want all of my students to be able to know the six articles of faith. And oftentimes when someone does the shahada, we point out to them these six articles of faith, the belief in one God, Tawheed, the belief in the angels, the Malaika, plural, belief in the holy books, Qutub, belief in the prophets, Nabuwa, belief in the day of judgment and afterlife, Akhira, and belief in fate or predestination, al -Qadr. So angels are heavenly beings created by Allah as a wajal from light, a luminous origin. And this is so beautiful if we stop and ponder and reflect on what you learned today, the light that you will receive, the enlightenment that you will receive will be very profound. Aisha. May Allah be pleased with her reported, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said the angels are created from light, just as the jinn are created from smokeless fire. And mankind is created from what you have been told about, which is clay. Now, I want you, here's this little pearl. The light, the clay will not produce anything without the light. If you take 
natural earth, if we did not have sunlight, the earth would not produce anything. If we don't have the light of God, we will not produce anything. We do not know precisely when they were created because the text does not tell us that. But we do know that angels were created as well as souls because we see this in Surah Al-Araf, Surah 7 of the Holy Quran, that angels were created before humankind uh, because the Holy Quran says in chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 30, Behold, your Lord said to the angels, I will create a vicegerent on earth. I will create Khalifa on earth, men and women who will serve me, who will be the property managers of this earth and return it to me the way that I gave it to them. The fact that Allah, as I was told them of his intention to create humans indicates that they, the angels and the earth already existed. So the earth and the angels and the souls were created before us. And there is a verse which I should have put in here that says there was a time that we were not even thought about. It's very powerful. So this is from Quran. There was a time when Allah had not even thought about us, it says. The clay, which is humankind's masjid, because it says that the earth is our masjid. It is our prayer place. The clay, humankind's masjid, the universe, was actually created again before humans. Created before and then and for us. Angels are naturally obedient creatures, worshiping Allah, carrying out Allah's commands, and communicating with humans. In Surah 66 of the Holy Quran, verse 6, they, angels, disobey not the commands they receive from God, but do that which they are commanded. So here we see they do not have freedom of will. They always do what they are commanded to do. The Quran and the and we are striving to be like them. Remember, there are four parts of the human being: the angel, the sort of demons that we have within us. Uh, you know, the demons we're working on. Um, and so we are striving to turn that dirt, that dirt clay nature of us, into an angelic nature. And that's why we talk about elevating our ranks as seekers of the divine in pursuit of the alchemy of happiness. The Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu prove that the angels may take human forms and that Allah blesses some people by making them speak to them. Allah says about Miriam, one of the poor perfect women, in chapter 19, Surah Miriam, verse 17, then we sent to her a ruh, Angel Jibril, and he appeared before her in the form of a man in all respects. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah exalt his mention, informed us that a man visited his brother in another town, and Allah disputed or deputed, sorry, deputed an angel to wait for him on his way. And when he came to him, he said, where do you intend to go? The man replied, I intend to visit my brother in faith, my Muslim brother, so to speak. The repayment you intend to get. So the, the angel is sort of questioning, are you going to get money he owes you? The man said, no, except that I love him for the sake of Allah. And this is the greatest love. When we go and we do what we do only for the sake of Allah. The man said, no, except that I love him for the sake of Allah, the exalted and glorious. Thereupon the angel told him, I am a messenger to you from Allah to inform you that Allah loves you as you love him for his sake. So we want to be able to have an understanding of this world and their relationship with us, this world of the angels. As confirmed by the prophetic narrations, the ahadith, the angels, visit gatherings where Allah is mentioned and visit the praying people at Asa prayer and Fajr prayer. This is when they change shifts. Abu Huraira 
And Abu Sa'id al Qudri, may Allah be pleased with him, reported the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, When a group of people assembles for the remembrance of Allah, and this is one of the reasons we have potlucks, the angels surround them with their wings. Allah's mercy envelops them. Sakina or tranquility descends upon them, and Allah makes some mention of them before those who are near him. We know the angels are in the heavens. That's where they predominantly live. They move back and forth from that realm to this realm. But imagine that they are doing all of this and we are unaware of them. After the revelation stopped, it was no longer possible to be certain that angels spoke to a specific person as it is impossible for a person spoken to be certain about it. So whoever the angel might have spoken to, it could be an illusion, it could be a trick of a jinn, it could be all kinds of things. What we want to make sure that we do is never claim definitely that an angel, we could say maybe I have a feeling I had an encounter with an angel, but we can't say for sure we don't have proofs. As narrated by Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, Allah's apostle said, angels come to you in succession by night and day. So we're never alone. We have these heavenly bodies coming to us night and day. And all of them get together at the time of Fajr and Asr. Those who have passed the day with you or stayed with you ascend to heaven. And Allah asks them, though he knows everything about you, well, in that state, in what state did you leave my slaves? Allah says to them. The angels replied, when we left them, they were praying. And when we reached them, they were praying. And this is why it is so painful when I know that people are not striving to pray five times a day, that they're not striving to get these this pillar of Islam, not an article, but a pillar of Islam to pray five times a day. Because imagine the angels of God coming and going back and saying, my sir, your servant was not worshiping you. Your servant did not bow down to you. Angels are genderless. They're gender neutral. They're obedient and worshipful creatures with no physical needs. And in the Quran, there are five verb forms, which mean angel. And just briefly, I'll cover them in some verses to sort of shed light on that. <clears throat> the first one sound, the first two sound very much alike because it's a singular and the sort of plural, but there is a distinction and I'll try to make that. Uh, the first one is Malak, or malai is the second. And it is used about 99 times in the Holy Quran with some angels designated by name, Jibril and Maqa'id. Um, Malak angels are found, uh, mentioned 15 times in the Holy Quran. And so just for a couple of examples in Surah Al-Baqarah verse two and, sorry, verse 102 of chapter two, that which was sent down upon Babylon's two angels, Harut and Marut. So here you see those names that I mentioned earlier. Um, chapter 6 and verse 8, yet we sent down an angel, the matter would have been determined. Um, go down to, say, verse uh, 95 of chapter 17, we have sent down upon them out of heaven an angel as a messenger. So we see some of those meanings. Um, the third verb form is Akaba. And in Surah Ara'ad, Surah 13 and verse 11, for each one are successive angels before and behind him who protect them by the decree of Allah. Indeed, Allah will not change the conditions of a people until they change what is in themselves. And when Allah intends for a people to be ill, there is no repelling it. And there is not for them besides him any patron. The fourth uh, verb form is uh, hafaza, 
which means recorders or guardian angels, and Surah 6, uh, Surah Al-An'am, verse 61, and he is the recorders or subjugators over his servants, and he sends over you guardian angels until when death comes to one of you, our messengers take him, and they do not fail in their duties. We fail in our duties as humans, but the angels never fail in their duties. And the fifth one is Talak, to receive, to meet, angel, receiver, guardian angel. And so in Surah Al Anbiya, Surah 21, verse 103, the greatest terror will not grieve them, and the angels will receive or meet them, saying, This is your day, which you have been promised. Um, in Surah Al Kaf, Surah 50, verse 17, when the two receivers, angels, receive, meet together, seated on the right and on the left. Um, so in Arabic, angels are called malaika, which means to assist and help. The Quran says that angels have been created to worship Allah and to carry out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. And so in Surah 16, verse 49 to 50, we find what is translated to mean everything in the heavens and every creature on earth prostrates to Allah. So if you look at the cows, they are grazing in the field, they are bowing down to Allah. If you look at every limb on every tree, it is bowing down to Allah. The flower stalk comes up and the flower surrenders to Allah. Muslims honor angels as, as an essential part of their faith. They are beautiful creations in so many ways. In Surah an najm the star, which I find is a little pearl here, the star is indicative of light. Angels are made out of light. In verse 6, Allah describes angels as dumirah. This is an Arabic term that renowned Islamic scholars Ibn Abbas and Qutada define as tall and beautiful in appearance. In Surah Yusuf, Surah 12 and verse 31, another beautiful correlation here describes Prophet Yusuf as beautiful like a noble angel. And if we look at the verse, and when she heard of their sly whisperings and taunting remarks, and this, of course, was the queen who seduced Yusuf, she sent for them and prepared a repast for them then. On the women's ar ar arrival, she gave each one of them a knife to eat the fruit with, and then said to Yusuf, alayhi salam, Come forth in the presence of these women. So when they saw him, they found him so beautiful, they cut their hands through wonder and said, Glory be to Allah. He is not a human being. He is an angel. So we often use a figure of speech in the English language. Oh, this is like, they're like angels. She's like an angel. He's like an angel. So angels have wings. So we do believe angels have wings and that they can be extremely large. Where is the proof of this? Because nothing in the Quran or the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad uh, indicate that angels are winged babies. So we see sometimes in various chapels, paintings of angels um, and they sort of propagate subliminally and even outwardly that angels are like babies. So sometimes people will say very tragically and, and not very sensitively when someone loses a child, Allah needed another angel in heaven. Don't ever say that to anyone. That's not comforting. Um, there are some ahadiths which you can give them that are very comforting, but that's not a very empathic thing to say to a human being. So we do know, however, that the angels do have wings and that some are extremely large from the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
it said that the space between heaven and earth was filled by the angel's wings. And this is in Sahih Muslim and in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. It says that that angel had 600 wings. And Surah Fatir, Surah 35, verse 1, all true and perfect praise belongs to Allah, the originator of heavens and earth, who employs as his messengers the angels, having two or three or four pairs of wings. And so possess the powers, speed, and qualities in varying degrees. He adds to the creation of these wings and thus to the powers and abilities of the angels. As much as he will, per the importance of the work entrusted to each one of them, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the possessor of power over every desired thing. Muslims don't speculate about their appearance. Muslims find it blasphemous, for example, to make images of angels as cherubs sitting on the clouds. We know that this is the subject matter of taswir or three-dimensional objects. Or um, There's an argument among the scholars that this is why Muslims do not create animated objects that can breathe because we will be commanded on the day of judgment to breathe the ruh, the life, into them. Uh, so we're not supposed to create these. Only Allah can create, humans cannot create. We have everything that we need to express ourselves is given to us by Allah, but we do not create it. We express ourselves through what Allah has created. Um, there are also different statuses. So just as we as humans are trying to elevate our ranks, as seekers of the divine, there are different statuses of the angels. Uh, the angels uh, present at the first battle, the Battle of Babel, are known as the best of angels. Angel Jibril came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked, how do you rate the people among you who were present at the Battle of Babel? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered, they are the best of Muslims or something similar. Jabril then said, so it is with the angels who were present at battle. And this is found in Sahih Bukhari. So here we see that the angels who were present at the battle of battle are a higher level of rank. We also know that the sustenance, their sustenance actually glorifies the law repeatedly. They never stop glorifying Allah. Unlike us as humans, we will sometimes complain, we'll even complain about what Allah brings to us. Um, the angels consistently are repeating La ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. In Surah Al Anbiya, uh, Surah 21 and verse 20, they glorify him night and day and they flag not. They do not pause or waver. They never get tired. In Surah Al-Fusilat, Surah 41 and 38, if they wax too proud to prostrate before him, let them know not. Those who are the near ones of your Lord glorify him night and day, and they never grow weary of it. They never grow weary of that prostration, that position of subdued that position of total sweet surrender to Allah. We know that angels do not require food. They do not require sleep or drink. They lack body desires. They don't have the nafs that we have. They do not get bored or tired of praising Allah. They have no freedom of choice. It is not in their nature to disobey. The story of Prophet Abraham in the Quran or Ibrahim also indicates that angels do not need food. When angels in the form of men visited Prophet Ibrahim salam, to give him the good tidings of a son's birth, he offered them a calf in their honor. They refused to eat and he became fearful. It was then that they revealed themselves as angels. This is indicated by the conversation between the Prophet Ibrahim salam, the friend of Allah, the Wali Allah, the Khalil of Allah, this, and the angels who visited him. 
And I did not mean to say Wali, I meant to say Khalil Allah. Um, Allah says in Surah 51, verses 26 to 28, Then he turned quickly to his household, brought out a fatted calf, and placed it before them. He said, Will you not eat? They did not eat. He conceived a fear of them. They said, Fear not. And they gave him glad tidings of a son endowed with knowledge. So here we have the proof for that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 11, verse 70, But when he, Ibrahim, saw their hands go not towards the meal, he deemed their conduct strange and became apprehensive of them, uneasy, and conceived a fear of them. They said, Fear not. We have been sent against the people of Lut only. So here's another reference of them speaking to humans and that they don't eat. Angels do not get bored or tired of remembering and worshiping Allah. In Surah 21, verse 20, they celebrate, extol his limitless glory, glorifying his praises night and day, nor do they ever slacken. In Surah Hamim, Surah 41 and verse 38, and though some of the pagans be too proud to listen to this call, this is referring to what I said earlier, if the unbelievers are arrogant and disdain his worship, let them, us, remember that the angels who are nearest to your rob glorify him day and night and never feel tired nor feel themselves above it. There are many angels but only Allah, as the Wajel, knows the exact number of angels. During his ascension, the Maraj to heaven, the Prophet ﷺ visited a house of worship known as the much frequented house, or in Arabic, al bayt al mamul the heavenly equivalent of Kaaba. And this is very beautiful. I'll just give a short story here. I'd love to just stop and teach this, but this is so beautiful because when we go to the Kaaba, which the angels built first on the earth, we are actually, it represents going to heaven because all of our sins, it's an earthly kind of like going to paradise because all of our sins are forgiven. And so listen to this, it's so beautiful. Then I was taken up to the much frequented house. This is the Sahih Bukhari. This is the proof of this. Every day, 70,000 angels visited and leave, never returning to it again. Another group coming after them. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, also informed us that on the day of judgment, we will be brought forth and shown to the people. He said, we will be brought forth that day by means of 70,000 ropes, each of which will be pulled by 70,000 angels. And this is Sahih Muslim. The angels have extraordinary powers. They can take on different forms, as we've seen. They appeared before Prophet Abraham and Prophet Lut, we saw as men. And in chapter 11 of the Holy Quran, verse 69, and indeed there came upon Ibrahim, our heavenly messenger, bearing a glad tidings. They bade him peace, and he answered, and upon you be peace, and made haste to place before them a roasted cross. So this is another reference of this. The angel Jabril appeared before Miriam, the mother of Isa, as a man. In Surah Ali Imran, Surah 3, verse 45, Lo, the angel said, O Miriam, behold, God sent thee the glad tiding through a word from him of a son who shall become known as Christ Jesus, son of Miriam, of great honor in this world and in the life to come, and shall be of those who are drawn near to Allah as a wajah. In Surah Miriam, Surah 19 and verse 17, we sent to her our angel, and he appeared before her in the likeness of a perfectly formed grown-up man in all respects. 
We know that the angel Jibril also appeared before Prophet Zachariah. In Surah 3, verse 39, his prayer was answered. Thereupon the angels called out unto him, O oh, Zachariah, we bring you bad tidings, the good news of the birth of, of a son whose name shall be Yahya, John. And God says, we confer distinction on him. His name shall be Yahya, John, a name we have not given to anyone before. The angel Gabriel appeared, as we know, many times before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the, when he appeared to him and squeezed his chest and said, Ikra Bismillah, read, recite in the name of your Lord. The angel Gabriel also appeared before Prophet Muhammad as a man whose clothes were exceedingly white and whose hair was extremely black. Also on the authority of Omar, may Allah be pleased with him, who said one day while we were sitting with the messenger of Allah, there appeared before us a man whose clothes were exceedingly white and whose hair was incredibly black. No signs of journeying were to be seen on that angel. And none of us knew that angel. That angel walked up and sat down by the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi resting their knees against his and placing the palm of his hands on their thigh. The angel said, oh, Muhammad, tell me about Islam. The messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, Islam is to testify that there is no God but Allah. And the Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, pillar number one, Tawheed. Pillar number two, not article, but pillar number two, to perform the prayers, the salat, to establish them regularly. Number three, to pay the zakat, to fast in the Ramadan, and to make number five, the pilgrimage to the house, if you can afford to do so. He said, you have spoken rightly. And we were amazed at him asking him and saying that he had spoken rightly. He said, tell me about Iman. He said, the angel, and we shouldn't say he because angels are neither male or female. So we should say they said, it is to believe in Allah. And here we go. This is the six articles. And we're looking at the second one. It is to believe in Allah, his angels, his books his messengers, and the last day, and then number six, to believe in divine destiny. So here we see these things that we should know the most about. He said to believe in good and evil, which is heaven and hell, also the article of the faith. He said, you have spoken rightly. Then tell me about Isan. He said, it is to worship Allah as if you see Allah. Now imagine that we talk about taqwa, often translated as the fear of Allah. We say that it is to have taqwa means that we see Allah in everything. But when we get from iman to isan, which is an elevated rank, not only do we see Allah in everything, we realize as we are traversing on this earth that Allah sees everything that we see and do. He said, the one questioned about it knows no better than the questioner, that the slave girl will give birth to her mistress and that you will see the barefooted, naked, destitute herdsmen competing in constructing lofty buildings. These are signs of the latter days. And if we look to the Kaaba, it was, we were, the whole area is sacred. They built these huge hotels overlooking the Kaaba. And some people actually believe they can sit on the top floor in the penthouse of that cop, of that Hilton and do Hajj and think it's going to be accepted. Then he took himself off and I stayed for a time. Then he said, oh, Omar, do you know who the questioner was? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. He said, that was Jibril who came to you to teach you your religion. And this is narrated in Sahih Muslim. The angels are also strong. Four angels carry the throne, Arsh, the throne of God. And on the day of judgment, their number will be increased to eight. 
Among the traditions of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is a narration that describes one of the angels carrying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne. The distance between that angel's earlobes and that angel's shoulders is equivalent to a hundred, seven hundred year journey. So let me say that again. This is from the Sunan Abu Da'ud. The distance between the angel's earlobes and the angel's shoulders is equivalent to a 700-year journey. Angels carry out various duties and responsibilities. Some are responsible for matters of the universe. Among the angels' task was to convey the revelation from Allah to his messengers. This is al-ruh, al-amin. Jibril, upon whom be peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 97, say whoever is an enemy to Jibril, for he brings down the revelation to your heart by Allah's will. And we'll come back to this verse and look at it even in more detail later on uh, in, a, in a subsequent lecture. We probably won't get to it today, maybe. However, what's beautiful to see here is the angels are of an elevated rank. So if you do anything against the angels, you become an enemy and your curse will come from Allah. We are not allowed to curse. We covered that in another class. But here you go. It's We have to understand and know about angels, my beloved brothers and sisters. In Surah 26, verse 193 and 94, which the trustworthy spirit, Angel Gabriel, has brought down from on high upon your heart, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you may be one of those who Allah points to warn and admonish the people. We also know that angels pull out souls. In Surah An-Naziat, Surah 79, verses 1 through 5, by those angels who violently pull out the souls of the wrongdoers, and move in their orbits with steady motion, gently drawing out the souls of the righteous. And those who guide, glide about swiftly through space on errands of mercy, conducting affairs obedient. Surah 32, verse 11, tells us the angel of death put in charge of you will duly take your souls. Then shall you be brought back to your Lord. MashaAllah. So angels will also blow the trumpet on the onset of the day of the judgment. And I will give you proof on the next class, inshallah. I've written a note to remind myself. I forgot to put the proofs in for that. Um, some angels are actually responsible for the winds, the rain, the seas, and the mountains. In Surah al Hijr. Surah 15 and verse 22, we send fertilizing winds and bring down rain from the sky for you to drink. It is not you who disposes of its source, holds its reserves. So here we see proofs of what I said. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, asked the Prophet Sallallahu have you ever faced any day more difficult than the day of Uhud? He said, I suffered at the hands of your people. And the worst that I suffered was that I suffered at the hands on the day of Aqaba. That was when I went to call Ibn Abdi Yalal Ibn Abd al-Khalal to Islam, and he did not respond. I left feeling depressed and hardly knowing where I was going. I did not recover until I found myself in Karn al-Fa'ali. I raised my head and saw that a cloud was shading me. I looked and saw Jibreel in the cloud. He called me and said, Allah has heard what your people said and how they responded to you. He has sent the angel of the mountains so that you can tell him to do to them whatever you want. The angel of the mountains called me and greeted me. Then said, oh, Muhammad, tell me what you want me to do. Do you want me to crush these people? He said, if you want, I can crush them between two mountains. The Prophet ﷺ said, all I hope for 
is that Allah will bring forth from their loins people who worship Allah alone and not associate partners with him. The Prophet ﷺ came to all mankind as a messenger of mercy. And here we see his beloved mercy. All I hope is that Allah will bring them to Islam, bring them to the light of Allah, and that they will not commit shirk, they will not be among the polytheists. Once after visiting the city of Ta'if, where they pelted, with, pelted him with stones till his sandals were covered in blood, the angel Jibril and the angel of the mountains visited him. The angel of the mountains offered to destroy the intractable people by burying them under the rubble of two nearby mountains. Prophet Muhammad declined the offer for he believed that if they had a chance to settle down and look at Islam, they would accept it and love Allah. So inshallah, we will continue on this subject and I will come back and Inshallah, touch your heart, if Allah wills, with some pearls from Imam Ghazali periodically. But I see such a need to make sure that believers are well aware of the five pillars, Arkan of Islam, and the six articles. These are the fundamentals of your religion. You've got to have them in order to be a sound, established Muslim with with yaqeen, with servitude. So I love you all for the sake of Allah as a wajal.